Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to an episode of Dojo Live. My name is Kim Lantis, airing from Hermosillo, Sonora, Mexico, and it's my pleasure to be with you today. Co-hosting with me is the wonderful America Guerrero, still Thank in Merida. You. Yes, here I am. Perfect. Thank you, Kim. And, of course, the most important person today, Matt Burns, our guest. Thank you so much, Matt, for being here with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And it's always nice to be the most important guest. That doesn't happen. <laughs> <much>. so, <laughs> yes, we all, need that. we all need that once, once in a while. So, Matt, you are the head of corporate affairs at Cypher Medicine. And really what we're going to be talking about today is tech and more specifically biotech. But before we get into that, please, let's learn a bit more about you. Matt, who are you? <laughs> it's a question. It's a question 20, 20 plus years into my career that I continue to ask. And um, I've been very fortunate to, to have sort of a, a diversity of experiences over the past two decades. I started out my career really um, first of all, for any baseball fans who are listening or U.S. baseball fans, I wanted to be the voice of the New York Yankees. And wow. uh, uh, that, that's an N of one who gets that job. And so uh, unfortunately, I had to reset my sights on, on something a little bit more uh, realistic and achievable at some point. And so I started out in my career in the first decade or so, really in various capacities inside and outside of government working in the political realm. Uh, it was first in the state of New York where I worked for um, former New York governor, George Pataki was his name. Mm -hmm. And I spent time working for the governor's administration, working actually on environmental and, and transportation issues uh, for a period of time. And I think the one thread that's really defined my career is um, I've, been, I've been really fortunate that I've either been collected or collected people along the way who have made that career sort of, tra the trajectory makes sense when I connect the dots on the relationships that I've been fortunate enough to, to have along the way. So after a stint of working in sort of state level government, um, relationships led me to Washington DC where I spent time at uh, the largest integrated healthcare system uh, in the US, which is the US Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, which is a, a massive federal agency with more than a thousand points of care across the US taking care of Wow. Um, America's, uh, America's uh, military veterans. And so that was really my transition into healthcare in the, in the mid 2000s. Um, subsequent to that, uh, I spent some time, uh, a little bit more time in politics on political campaigns and for about five years before I realized that I needed to get myself an honest job. And that, that, uh, <laughs> my, my, uh, my, some of my relatives wondered every time I spoke to them, I was in a new campaign or I was doing something different. And uh -huh. they were like, is he, is he ever going to get, get a job, uh, that <laughs> lasts more than one campaign cycle. And, and so it, sure. it, <laughs> it was a lot of fun though. And, and, you know, the one thing about public service, I, I would really put a public service announcement out there for is public service in any government, probably in any country is more apt to give you responsibility in an earlier stage of your career mm. than the private sector typically will. And so there's something nice. really to be said about the notion of public service because there's so much being taken on by governments uh, that there's a real opportunity to learn um, a lot more, more quickly than you might otherwise, um, just sort of cutting your teeth in the private sector. And so um, I then use that, that experience and I transitioned seamlessly into working for um, one of the largest healthcare payers in the U.S., a company called United Health Group. And I spent the better part of a decade there, a, a very innovative, massively growing company. Um, and, and you don't really think of that in your, your health insurers, but I think just the, the unbelievable costs of healthcare for everybody right. has got a, a lot of people pulling levers, trying to figure out how do you improve the experience, lower the cost, um, and, and drive better health outcomes. And so that's really that triple aim of healthcare. I got a lot of experience over almost a decade working at United Health Group and then subsequently for one of the other large health insurers uh, in the U.S. that's a mutual company called Healthcare Service Corporation which belongs to the Blue Cross Blue Shield family or, or works with the Blue Cross Blue Shield family. And then uh, I said to myself, okay, I've worked for companies with massive, um, massive resources and right. massive number of employees and trying to crack big problems with big resources. And I had this collecting epiphany. People. Right. Yeah, collect, collecting well, people. Collecting me. Collect, right. <laughs> just the relationships. You just can't understate the value of those, um, you know, in your, in your professional career. And I've, I can't say that enough, how fortunate I've been, but I had this epiphany about the time my father was diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and he was otherwise and remains healthy now. Um, thank God. But he really just um, has been battling it for five years, though. And 15 years ago, if he'd been diagnosed with the same condition, even 15 years ago, he already would have sadly probably been a statistic and passed away. Uh, but because of advancements in very aspe various aspects of healthcare and therapeutics and diagnostics and other things that we're probably going to touch on a little bit today, mm -hmm. um, he, he was able to get to a stage of, of remission. And now it's almost like a chronic condition management versus something nice. that is- He is a statistic, but the one we want. That, that's right. I, I think that's well said, Kim. And, uh, and so that led me though, to have this moment of what can I do to work for companies that are really at the cutting edge of the things that we need to do in medicine. And that led me to my first biotech experience, um, which was a company called Grail um, that you may or may not have heard of, but they're developing a test that um, can detect up to 50 types of cancer through a single blood draw, the notion of what? early detection. Uh, it's pretty wild. And I stayed with that company until it was um, acquired by Illumina. Um, so I was there just under two years and it was acquired and then decided to um, pursue uh, another startup. And that has brought me to Cypher. So that's not the Very abridged good. version. It's a long, long story, but that's a little bit about kind of the meandering I've done over the past two decades. No, I love it. I think it gives a lot of insight to you as an individual, as a person and just the Your personality mm -hmm. yeah, that are out there um, that lead us to where we are. So talking about Cypher, I know um, a few minutes ago you mentioned this goal of increasing quality and lowering cost, becoming more efficient. Um, I understand that that's a lot of what Cypher is all about as well. Yeah, that's really, it's really well said. I think there's a lot of companies that are trying to crack, crack that nut. And, and, and really the, the, the human genome project 20 years ago, the mapping of the human genome really set off to some degree, a, an evolution or a revolution, but after a decade, and that's 20 years ago now. And, and even, even then though, it's precision medicine is the idea that the notion that you can get the exact right treatment to the right individual at the right time is still, I would describe it as a work in progress. Mm -hmm. And there's been an incredible amount of sort of uh, uh, progress made in oncology in particular, because it's such a massive killer, right? It's you know, number one or two killer of, of human beings every, every year um, across, across the world. And, but there hadn't really been any movement into autoimmune disease. And there are millions of people across the world who are suffering from psoriatic arthritis, MS, mm -hmm. uh, rheumatoid arthritis being one of the most prominent ones. And so what Cypher set out to do was really try to figure out how do we get the right people to the right sort of um, treatments uh, at the right time as quickly as possible. Because uh, autoimmune diseases, which is what Cypher focuses on, um, they're, they're not acute in the sense that they're going to kill somebody immediately, right. but they deteriorate the quality of life very exactly. quickly. And the way that it works today is there's leading drug classes called um, TNF or TNFI, as it were. And those are big, think of the big monster drugs, the, the Remicades, the Embrels, um, uh, all, all, all of those large TNF drugs. And the, the reality is uh, Humira being the other one, obviously the big one, second leading um, drug sales in the world. They do a lot of those drugs, those therapeutics do a lot of good for a lot of people. But the reality is 90% of the people today who are diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis there's a million and a half people in the U.S. alone, millions more around the globe. They all experienced the sort of same journey, which was, mm -hmm. hey, um, you have been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Go on these drugs. And 90 percent of people go on that first line of therapies. And the reality is and kind of shocking reality is that more than half of those people aren't ever going to respond to those drugs. Wow. They then begin a sort of trial and error with the rheumatologist, trying to get them to a place where their condition is under control. I, I equate it to having a fire in your kitchen, if you're one of those patients, and you want to put it out before it spreads to the rest of the house, your body. Right. Wow. And so what we've set out to do is through a blood test, if one is a moment you're diagnosed with one of these autoimmune diseases, is you take this blood test and we can tell you with a degree of certainty and help the doctor, uh, whether or not you're going to respond to some of those first line treatments. In time, we think our, our uh, you know, sort of our um, test will be able to evolve to say, rather than just, hey, you're not going to respond to, hey, this is the drug class you're most right. likely to respond to. 
And so we're starting out in rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, we will be moving, launching um, four additional tests over the next four or five years, all around getting autoimmune disease patients to the right therapy as quickly as possible. So we're, we're really excited about what that will mean for patients. Amazing. And that, I think that's a good segue into the, today's topic, which was chosen by you. America, what is it? Yes. So from startups to solving healthcare biggest challenges, and you already mentioned some. So the question is how leading biotech companies can differentiate themselves in a sea of sameness. What does that mean? Why did you choose this topic? You already mentioned some well, well, you already uh, you already respond this, but what else could you share with us? Yeah, the the, the reason I picked this is because it really it, it really gets at my my wheelhouse, right? My area of expertise in which I've been helping, whether it's political candidates, companies, uh, startups, try to tell their story cogently and consistently. And I think um, as the more I've been exposed to early stage companies. I think inevitably they all kind of go from this. We have a brilliant technology mm -hmm. and everybody should immediately accept it, adopt it, pay for it, whatever, whatever the particular challenge for those companies might be. And the part where I feel incredibly fortunate to get to be part of telling some of these stories is um, how do you differentiate in a sea of sameness? It's it, to me, it doesn't seem hard, but despite the fact I'm exposed to people, it seems harder to is okay. Most of these may, these companies coming up with big solutions follow a similar story narrative or should the good ones. Necessity. really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The good ones really follow a basic framework. I think consistently, I don't think they intentionally have done that, but the more I look at them, the companies that really separate themselves, whether it's in raising money, significant valuations, significant exits, it's in this notion of saying, okay, what is the massive unmet need that we are addressing? And you start by talking about and consistently making sure that people understand why there is an unmet need that ultimately is harming patients in some way and harming people. And then inevitably, the second thing you then talk about is that is a whole, you basically start with this notion of there's a terrible problem. It's affecting people. It's costing too much money. Like you, you basically lay out the problem statement. Then the effective companies immediately say, we believe, and they do variations of this, we believe there's a better way, right? That's almost always step two for like the really good companies. We believe there's a better way. And that then allows them in their storytelling to transition to, let us tell you about how we believe there's a better way and our unique value proposition to the market and to the solving this problem. It might be um, like ours, a platform company that combines artificial intelligence and other things but ultimately is about cracking the nut of that big problem. Um, so you equate it to big problem, unmet need, we have a big solution, and then you can get into, now let me tell you more specifically the types of products and things that we're going to introduce and what success looks like and what it means for society, humanity, all of the stakeholders within that. And once you've established that, and I always call it your core narrative, once you've established that core narrative, you just have to repeat, right? Marketing 101 tells you that people have to hear, thing, <laughs> hear things somewhere between seven and 10 times before it begins to resonate with them. Right. So the most effective companies that separate themselves, and I sound, I sound like a lecturer now, um, I get passionate because I really no, believe in this. You're, you're repeating. <laughs> exactly, right? You, you, like I always, tell, I always tell the CEOs that I work with, um, hey, listen, we've got our core narrative down. It's a very convincing story. It's clearly convincing for most of these companies because they raise money. But I think as you get to the later rounds, the story has to be cogent. It has to be consistent. And I always tell the CEOs, when you get tired of hearing yourself say the same thing, you need to go home, take a nap, take a shower, eat lunch, come back, and then repeat it again and again mm -hmm. and again and again. Um, and that's, I mean, that's it in a, in a nutshell, what I think makes the most successful companies differentiate themselves is they, they operate and they message with an unbelievable discipline. And, uh, and I just can't emphasize that enough to, to your viewers that if you want to be, it doesn't guarantee success, mm -hmm. but for people to understand your idea and believe in it, um, you need to keep hitting it home over and over and over and over again. So. so what I'm hearing is this idea of like 
one story, if we want to look at this in terms of an actual book, right, a, a, a novel of sorts, and you have to build out each chapter that makes sense sort of in and of itself, but still within that, that book to complete an entire story. And each chapter is sort of reiterating and learning and growing and evolving as the company grows, but still within that same story. So is this a formula you think can apply not just in biotech, but to really any, any startup, any company? Verticals? Yeah, I, I really do believe that um, that discipline, and, and frankly, a lot of my experience in it was born out of politics. If you think about people running for political office, whether it's the high, you know, whether it's, you know, Congress in the U.S. or president or prime minister of, of a country, um, they, they, A, they really identify what the problem statement is, which is why am I running? What, what am I going to do differently? And he or she makes that decision and they figure out, okay, now what is my platform on how I'm going to change things? And then they go out and they have a million different ways to deliver that message digitally today. It's in-person speeches, it's, mm -hmm. it's me media one-on-ones, it's, it's television, it's what, whatever it might be. Um, and so that same discipline that is born out of political campaigns when applied to companies like this and kind of how I view it is it, it is agnostic to verticals. I mean, put simply, um, if you exercise, if you establish your story, you establish how you're going to improve things um, for people and have a human element to what you're doing and how you're going to help people. Uh, I think that is a formula that resonates across any any vertical and can really be applied effectively. Your tactics may vary depending on who mm -hmm. you're trying to convince. You might message to somebody who is a, a prospective investor one way, and you may speak to um, people you're hoping to come join your cause in hiring in a slightly different way. But the same crux of who you are and what you're trying to achieve, which is something bigger than self, uh, re really doesn't change no matter what sort of enterprise you're working for, I've found, at least in my experience. Can you share any experience or tips that you might have if someone or company were to confront the reality that their story needs to be rewritten? What if, you know, how do we pivot in the sense of like, geez, this is the story, but it's no longer our story or it's not a very good story to prevent this interpretation that it's just backtracking or, or something of that of that sort, right? But how can we go about making sure that our story is a good story worth telling? And if we find out that it isn't, what might be the formula for such cases? Yeah, I think, I think that's a really salient point to raise. And it's a very difficult one that especially a lot of early stage companies are confronted with, which is, hey, you know, we've got this, we've got this incredible widget. We've got this incredible technology. We have something incredible that we want to bring to the world. And a lot of companies fall into the trap of, now we just got to get somebody to pay for it. And, and, then, <laughs> yeah, and so, and so the, the entire journey is this meandering between this is a great technology that can help humanity, but nobody wants to pay for it. How, how, how great could it really possibly be? And so what I, on the messaging front um, and having been in two early stage companies now um, that I would submit to you are pretty successful. What I always say is like, start broad, mm. meaning, Right. Like start from the position of we have something that is fundamentally going to help patients who suffer from X condition. And you might be if you start out specific in, say, this autoimmune disease, that's that's a tougher thing to reel back in. If you say you have something that can help a broader a segment right. of the population um, or that it serves a particular area, then you're going to be a lot better off when you have to start narrowing within that, because ultimately, most of the time, the underlying technology still has some application in the original broad statement that you set out to say that it was going to fix. So the way I say it, for example, uh, would submit to you at Cypher Medicine, what, and what we are doing is start with something along the lines of, you know, we are creating solutions that help patients get to the right medications as quickly as possible. And, and then if you want to go a little bit deeper, we say on the journey from diagnosis to remission, our technology supports that journey from diagnosis to remission. And then if we want to go another step deeper, we might say that we do that in a couple of different ways. And that's where you start to get into, okay, we still can room back, we can still back up to the broader narrative. And that holds true, even though some of the, the, the products or solutions that you might deliver along the way may be more convincing to the marketplace and, and to those end users um, than you'd originally perceived, right? So for us, it's, um, 
are tests that with a single blood draw, you can determine whether somebody's going to respond to medication. We mm -hmm. put that as one of the solutions on diagnosis to, to, uh, to end to uh, remission. We also can use the same platform technology to identify potential drug targets to get new medications or existing medications that could be repurposed um, in the hands of practitioners um, more quickly using that same technology. We can identify the possible targets uh, for new drugs and new therapies and get them to the end state more quickly, we believe, with that same technology. Um, same idea, same story, a slightly different value proposition and customer for, for what you're introducing to the marketplace. Really, really great points. So let's talk a little bit more about Cypher Medicine and your technology and your platform. How, how is this working? I mean, I, I understand large data at play, lots of numbers, in, lots of individuals and who knows, countless you know, ways that that could, could piece together. So how does your technology make, make this possible in an actual realistic, timely manner? Yeah, and, and I would share that a lot, like a lot of biotech companies, I mean, tech is in the name, you know, of the category for a reason, right? With, mm -hmm. Without some of those, those platform systems that people create, it's, uh, that's, where the, that's where the value is really derived from for uh, stakeholders in the health system. And we're no different. So in a nutshell, um, there were two really interesting and bright guys, one at Northeastern, who was a network scientist and a doctor at Harvard. And they had this idea that um, it's called the human interactome now, and it's somewhat open source to, to a degree now, but they had this notion of imagine a city's subway map or the tube, and you have all the points that you could see on there of stops. But imagine if you took away the, the lines that got you connected to the points and those little points are proteins. So that's what kind of protein mapping okay. had been previously. Everybody knew that there was a ton of different proteins, but nobody had the map of how they interact with each other and how you get how one might mm. affect the other. And so these guys came up with a mapping and, and really spent a lot of time at, at Harvard and Northeastern with their teams developing this mapping called the human interactome, more than 19,000 proteins and their interactions between. So imagine that, whatever the end wow. of 19,000, 19,000 <laughs> touching each other, a lot, right? A lot more than I can explain. So then they, that was the foundation. And we um, entered an agreement with them to use that technology, couple it with our own way of um, our, our own set of data, one of the largest data sets that we had begun to collect on autoimmune disease and patients mm -hmm. specifically with autoimmune disease. And then we wrote, wrote proprietary algorithms. And so coupling those three things together is called our spectra platform. And really what that enables us to do is take that blood test, put it through that sort of system, if you will, and make a prediction about whether or not somebody's likely to respond to the particular medication that they're going to be prescribed. And that will continue to get the more data we get, the more tests we get, the more data we know about autoimmune patients, the smarter that we get about how that will work. And so all of those things together are the backbone and foundation to any products that we might introduce, whether it's those, the blood tests that I described, or it's trying to help drug companies or maybe in our own targets um, that we develop, create more effective medications. We might say, hey, you know what? In um, rheumatoid arthritis, if we touch this protein over here and we target that one, we're going to have some sort of downstream effect on the efficacy of that medicine more quickly than we might otherwise just doing trial and error for an indefinite period of time. Because look at, uh, right. in the US at least, FDA trials today, how many of them get you know, to phase two, phase three, and they're, and they end up being, they find out that all that money and time invested sadly to, to, to no end. And so precision yeah. medicine companies like Cypher using technology and new ways of thinking about things um, can, I think really be part of the solution of, of creating efficiency in the healthcare system and certainly improving the quality and outcomes of care that patients can expect. Of course, it seems like a perfect mashup of, you know, the idea of human intelligence and innovation coupling with software technology to make that idea a reality because we're talking about numbers and combinations that we as people couldn't possibly analyze or in our lifetimes anyway. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. So as we switched and we're coming actually to the end of our show today, um, let's talk a bit more about Cypher, your experience of what it's been to work for such a company. What's, what's the culture like? 
the culture is uh, at any company, but specifically um, Cypher in, in my experience is, is, is it's excitement, right? It's um, it's, it's got to be slightly bridled. I don't want to say unbridled optimism, but the, you have to have a great deal of optimism. Um, and so we started out, let me put it in context. We were a company like a lot of other companies started out with pretty modest funding to get us started for the first few years. And at this point, we're five, five years old, six years coming up on six years old. We've raised um, 227 million uh, US wow. dollars. 192 of which was in the last 13 months or so. So people are like, right. As that story becomes more powerful to people, um, the, the, the ability to raise more money to advance that mission is, is uh, becomes more real, right. And more people get behind it. So you get momentum. And so I think that the word I would hit on to describe culture is the notion of mission. I, I firmly believe that most people aren't motivated by getting out of bed to do something that is not like creating internal warm feeling about what they're doing in the world. And that's why I liked working for my previous biotech. And that's what I really like about working at Cypher. We're taking a problem mm -hmm. that is, you know, typical person with autoimmune diseases, a 30 to 50 year old woman, you know, like my wife's age, who just wakes up one day with pain that she can't really quantify. And she's been suffering in silence and the notion that we're going to be able to help large swaths of people get solutions more quickly and get relief more quickly so they can get back to the, the workplace. They can get back to raising their family if that's what they're doing. Um, we're very mission driven at Cypher. And I think people are optimistic and they join us, not just because of salary, although biotech does compensate you fairly well in the, in the grand scheme of things. But I think the reality is people feel like they're contributing to something that will be a legacy for them. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'd say that's what the, the culture is at Cypher. And listen, we're also not naive. We see the headwinds coming for a lot of biotechs right now. Right. There's 200 biotechs right now that are worth more with the cash they have on their balance sheet, sheet than they are um, in the marketplace. Right. The cash is worth more. B basically, people are saying, you know, it's a losing proposition to invest in certain companies. But we've 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 stemmed that off so far. We've been very fortunate. We have we have great investors. And I think it comes back to that notion that if you have a powerful enough mission uh, and your people believe in that mission uh, and you have that story and you advance that story, um, you can pretty much get through a lot. And the power of the idea at the end of the day with with the kind of smart people that you have work on these problems uh, is, is really exciting. It's an exciting thing to be around. I think that it's amazing that you took all this responsibility from the public segment. It's something that you explained at the beginning of the show. I read on your website that you have this risk, tolerant, uh, transparency, hardworking core values. I think that I'm missing another one. I don't remember. You are. There, 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 there is actually, yeah, there, there's hardworking, transparent, um, risk tolerant. Um, and we also believe in... Um, in communicating with one another. So open communications and along with transparency, and I'm, you're putting me on the spot. I'm missing one now too. I'm, <laughs> pa pause the live show. So, okay. so, yeah. <laughs> no, but I think what's, what's amazing about this is the BD and how all of those kind of connect together and they connect in your story and how we as individuals and then as organizations and then the people that those, that organization is impacting you know, it really is a story of connectedness and you look at the individuals and it's not just, and that's what it is because it's not just an individual with an autoimmune disease or anything else long-term. Like you, you brought that up. It's their employer, their home, their family, their friends, and it just ripples out. And I think the, the quicker we can put a stop to that ripple, the entire world, all of society benefits from that. And so thank you so much, Matt, for your contribution, for Cypher Medicine's contribution, for the ability of very smart people and very smart tech uh, to work together to accomplish big things. Well, listen, as we get further along, I would love to come back and see you all again, uh, America and, and Kim. It's, uh, it's absolutely been a pleasure speaking with you today. So thank you for the opportunity. No, it's been our pleasure. Thank you. And we'll take you up on that offer. Um, anytime you've got a new release or new tech or something that you'd like to bring and draw attention to, we'll certainly touch that here on Dojo Live. So can you believe it? We're at the end of our half hour already. 
folks. That's it. The Matt show was the final show for this week. But go ahead and catch us Monday, 12 o'clock Pacific, for our recap show. We'll give you our insight and our opinions on the shows that we had this week. And then we'll let you know what's coming up for next week. So don't miss it. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.